It's not a ter- word even for speaking your mind. God, anyway, shoot, I'm ready. Okay, um, we're now streaming live. Hello, I'm John from Broadway. Hi, John. Ha- happy Saturday morning, now that you're up. And uh, everybody's up. The dogs are up. Um, yeah, yeah, no, no, no. The life has begun. It's springtime. Great. Jingling-a-ling. Um, what, uh, we're joined by David Langmolner, human rights lawyer um, uh, in England, London, uh, just outside London. Uh, you've got a dog there, uh, David. Two. What's going on? Two. Two. Uh, what Two are their names? Marcy and Edna. And Labradors. Labs are beautiful. This is like desert island discs or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, 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 it usually is Edna who's barking, although I stand to be correct in that particular point. One is black, one is white. Edna. I'm just going to put this, uh, you talk away, a um, lot to talk, talk about. Let's start with Prince Philip. Uh, actually, would you mind if I, if, uh, if I um, mentioned a, a gentleman who died this week, or has just announced the death this morning of uh, Shahili. Um, Shahili, you may not know him, David. He was, um, oh, I do know who Shahili was. Yeah, no, I do. Uh, I, um, I'm kind of not of that generation, but I grew up watching people like him. Of course, yeah. He wrote. Um, yeah. He wrote Johnny Logan's Eurovision Song Contest. Yeah. Once another year, and he, he did. Was, uh, yeah. Nighthawks. In fact, he won Eurovision twice or three times, and Nighthawks as well. I mean, there was a, <clears throat> there was in the nineteen seventies, eighties, in Ireland, a cultural vitality, uh, which doesn't really exist now. I mean, you had Father Ted, you had Scrap Saturday, uh, people like Jerry Stembridge and all of them, and uh, they, they were allowed function. Uh, whether they're allowed function anymore is, is um, the culture of satire and criticism, save in a very light way, has kind of gone out of the criticism of the Irish political body politic. And um, yeah. yeah, I mean, that's, it's, it's, sad, it's sad to hear that. But he, he must have had a reasonable Well, he was 78. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, Jeremy Morgan uh, lived far too uh, fast. Yeah. Um, well, we, again, uh, uh, Dermot was a very good friend of Shay's, actually. Um, yeah, yeah. No, I, I was of the generation uh, pro, uh, subsequent to those people. Uh, well, they are significantly subsequent. But when, when I would be um, 14 or 15, I would go to the Allen H and you'd see Dermot Morgan performing there. I mean, right. Um, uh, that was the, the the great old days of Ellen H debating. I was part subsequently, maybe 10, 15 years later, of the last great days of Trinity College debating. Uh, and I, at that stage, I think Trinity was triumphant and the UCD Ellen H system had fallen a little bit down to destitute. They won't like me saying that. But, um, but, but there is no doubt that in their pomp, the UCD system wasn't. Uh, the Ellen H with people like Dermot Morgan or Felix McElroy, who's a barrister in Dublin, or, or Adrian Hardiman, above all else, was just, it was theatre. It, it was actually bread in circuses. And, yeah. Uh, people would flock to it, you know? Yeah. Um, enormous cultural contribution, as indeed the chair he Sure. Um, I just want to briefly, because um, I knew Shay very well back in the 90s. We were. Uh, Good old pals, and uh, he was just a very nice chap. He was uh, very kind to everybody who knew him. His wife, Dimplin, was uh, and sons. Um, I, I worked with one of his sons, uh, Fanon. Uh, just a lovely, lovely family, lovely people, uh, and uh, it's well. I mean, I think we should pay um, tribute uh, to. People have made a cultural difference in Ireland. It's a quite a difficult thing to do, um, of a genuine nature. And um, uh, I mean, I didn't know him personally, so I don't have the personal experience you have of him. Yeah. And, um, and that's a problem um, for me. Common, save that yeah, yeah, you know yeah. he did win the Eurovision twice through Johnny no, he, Logan. I think he wrote two. No, didn't he win two songs for Johnny Logan? No, he just he just wrote the one, and then Johnny wrote his other his his own. Oh yeah, uh, what's another year? What's was, another year then? Was and it was a kind of strange. It's a strange song. It's like uh, it's a very very unusual uh, arrangement. If you listen to that song, it's very un, uh, unorthodox song to win the Eurovision. You know, it's not 
Baba Dabba Dabba. Well, I mean, before Blandness really completely, don't forget, if Abba won the Eurovision with a great Yeah, yeah indeed, before, indeed. It was in that, uh, it was in that uh, kind of era. Yeah, uh, and, um, you know, you, you get a lot of old fogies like us talking about how, you know, it's odd, Abba, a good reflection of this. Uh, at the time, most people thought it was designer pop and kitsch. And now, the, the, 30 years later, they become... Um. Uh, regarded as utter classics. And part of that, of course, is given the nonsense that is around today, they have um, they have transcended their populism and music quality at the time, become standards. Yes. And that's, that's also a reflection of the decline in, in the popular song. I've actually written a piece, which you haven't published yet, on music, music for lockdown. But, oh, um, really? Have you said that? Yeah. 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 But, um, um, you, you, uh, and the other thing is, uh, could we just switch onto my phone? Could you let me into this because the battery is a bit low on the computer thing? I'm sure it'll be the same. Oh, I just uh, asked you meeting post oh, Sorry, I thought that I thought you that was a mistake, but I so I, I, I got rid of it. <laughs> I thought that was something, yeah. yeah well, would you want me to do it again? Yes, if you yeah, well, yeah, we've got a few minutes left in this, but I don't want to go uh, and lose the connection with you. But it is, sorry, it, it is a terrible I'm, thing. Uh, yeah, I'm very glad that you that were prepared we anyway. David. Losing some of our uh, cultural figures. And of course, the other thing is the Irish are very good at being kind to people when they're dead. Yeah. They're not very good at being kind to them when they're alive. Well, to be fair, uh, can, I just, can, can I just say on Shea, he was one of those yeah. very unusual uh, Dublin men whom nobody really had a bad word to say against. You know, he... Well, I mean, that's, um, that's, that's very unusual. Yeah. Um, it, it, he started as a cameraman, and so he could talk to anybody, could be, be, be around anybody, uh, interview pretty much anyone. In fact, he was instrumental in a way in, in, Sean, in Charlie Hawhey's downfall. Uh, David, I've lost you there. David? <laughs> Hello, David? <laughs> David? <laughs> okay. Sermonis, uh, we seem to have lost David. Um, I'd like to talk about Shay, actually, uh, if it's possible. Um, I'll just share the screen here. Um, so Shay Healy has died at the age of 78. Um, he, yeah, what I was saying was that he was instrumental um, when he was presenting Nighthawks. David, are you there? <laughs> oh, here, hang on. Okay, David? Uh, oh, sorry, I, I warned you about that, John. Hello? Yeah, hi. I warned you about that. I said the other thing was, so, I mean, if you break up, so you were talking about him being a nice Dublin person. Oh, just, just a very nice guy, um, but also... Yeah. When he was presenter of this program, Nighthawks, he interviewed yeah. Sean Doherty, who was who had been the Minister for Justice. Oh yeah. When when those journalists were bugged, they had their phones yeah. bugged. Uh, I think Bruce Arnold and Geraldine Kennedy. Who ultimately, I think, got about fifty thousand compensation from Bertie Ahern as next Gracia payment. But many many years later, yeah, and of course that was a privacy violation David, at the time. Yes. Yeah, let, let me. I'll just finish. I'll just finish it because it, there, there, yeah, yeah. There's a little bit more to it. Um, so he interviewed O'Doherty, and O'Doherty had always maintained that uh, I'd kind of taken the rap for the for the bugging, and that whole he really knew nothing about it. Yeah. But uh, during this small interview in Nighthawks, this kind of late night show, O'Doherty revealed that whole he knew, and that led to whole he being removed, Albert Reynolds. Uh, and the and the and the end of Hohi effectively. So it was. So I think it's important in historical terms that there as well. Very I very mean, very important. I mean, in, I gather uh, he was told to ask a certain. You know, he was suggested you might want to ask them this question, and he did. And anyway, kind of changed history, I guess, in a way. Well, all great journalists have uh, interviewers have an ability to get the best out of people by 
almost soft skills or soft tactics, the way it makes someone feel comfortable. If people feel it's also something you need as a barrister when you're taking instructions from a client and you're in a prison cell or you're um, you're sitting down with them, you, you've got to um, get under their skin. I don't mean that in a bad way, but you've got to see things in an empathetic way from their point of view. And if um, Sean Doherty felt comfortable with Shay Healy, um, that is a credit of Shay Healy's skill set, that he was able to maneuver his way around different vectors of Irish society at that point in time, yeah. and for people to trust him. Yeah, uh, which is, and, and of course, it is very. It's a very sparse quality in the ground in Ireland now that there are people who people trust. Um, uh, and uh, you know, I do remember Nighthawks, uh, uh, and um, it was a useful uh, experiment. Of course, the fact of the matter is, how could you have a Nighthawks today when all the pubs are closed? Yeah. And we were set inside a, a kind of a boozy late night bar. Um, yeah, selling real, or not selling, but serving real alcohol. So it was kind of an well, interesting... Well, yeah. Um, I mean, we, we are too much of a nation like that at one level, but now we've gone to the absolute opposite extreme. And um, my, my fear, I think it's yours as well, is that we're killing all levels of individuality, creativity, and culture. In, in the broad, broadest sense of the term, aye, aye, aye. Uh, such that our sense of identity is going down the toilet. Even. Well, yeah. Um, Collective sense of identity. It does seem to. Um, uh, Prince Philip uh, yes. also died um, in 1909. Well, my heart goes out to the Queen of England um, um, because she's um, elder, very elderly. She's a little younger than him, but not significant, say. What age and, you uh, she's I think she's she's over ninety as well, isn't she? But I think she's early nineties. Um, I mean, he Prince Philip gets or got a bad rap for some of the things he was saying. <laughs> this morning I got up, uh, knowing you'd be asking about that. Uh, some of his quotes are outrageous, obviously, uh, but some of them are outrageous in a kind of good way. Um, some of the things he says, I think. I mean, and also he was quite reflective about it. He's, he, he, he famously went to a dentist convention and he said uh, uh, there is a thing called dentopodology. Uh, and he said, well, that means putting your foot in your mouth. And I do that all of the time, which showed a wonderful sense of reflectiveness, which he had on several different occasions. And he wasn't afraid to annoy people. I mean, I, mean, I think that's a very good thing as well. Uh, for example, he, he goes to Thailand to collect uh, uh, an award and gives out to them and says that they, they're destroying all of their endangered species. It causes a diplomatic incident, but of course he, he, he is right about it. He, he, before he died, he came back and fashioned the virus in a way because he, he said famously he'd like to be reincarnated as a virus, which would in, infect the world population. He was obviously very concerned at profligacy in population terms he made several comments uh, about that in various aspects of his of his visits as well so i think when people say that he he, he was capable of the most appalling gaps some of the things he said were 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 refreshingly candid for someone in yeah. his position um and some of them made some degree of sense uh, quite a lot well i think the viral comment is very revealing about you know, the elite, an elite thought about population uh, control, they're absolutely obsessed with, with it. You know, the, there's too many people, too many of us, that's their view. Uh, whether that feeds into the COVID narrative is a different, for a different... Yeah, uh, but, but, but it, was an, it, it was an extraordinary thing. Um, uh, to say, um, yeah. To say, uh, and yeah. uh, he, in fact, he said something similar uh, when he was in another country and he was informed that there was a 5% growth in population and he was shocked by it. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know what that must mean. I suppose, I mean, he's, he was 99 years of age, so he grew up in a simpler world with less people, less crowd, less congestion, where life was more straightforward. It, it, it might be... Uh, it would, no, I, I, I think there is just a coterie of people and there are the elite who are completely obsessed. I mean, for instance, Spike Milligan, who was... Um, yes, I know who Spike Milligan was. I know, I know, but it's just in terms of the royals, the, like uh, a friend of the royals, a friend of Charles's. Uh, he was being interviewed by Anthony Clare. Um, yeah. 
And I think Anthony Clare had seven children, eight children. I think so, yeah. I, I only met Anthony Clare about three or four times. He's a former winner of the Observer Mace. I met him mm. in one Mace final. And then I think I may have met him privately uh, uh, once or twice. Um, well, yeah, uh, did, yeah, but, but, but he was in tune, Spike, and uh, Spike Milligan turned on him and said, You've got seven children. How selfish, how completely, you know, uh, blind you are to what's happened, you know. The, the Prince Philip line, you know, the kind of... Well, it's a, it's not unlike the, the Monty Python song in The Meaning of Life, yeah. Uh, yeah. Where, where they all go, uh, you know... Every uh, sperm is sacred. Every it? sperm is sacred. Every sperm is, a sperm is great. If a sperm gets wasted, God gets quite irate. And, of course, that's spoken from the perspective of a Roman Catholic family, as opposed to uh, 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 later caricaturing Protestants who regulate... Uh, their families, or, or, or it is said, regulated their families differently. Um, uh, I mean, whether, I mean, whatever, I mean, Spike Milligan was of Irish origin as well. Uh, yeah. So it, it cannot, and he, I think he may have been a Catholic. So it cannot be a reflection of uh, uh, Anthony Clare in that way. But no, no, no. It's, I, it's, it's purely I, about the population, like they, they, yeah. They'd like to yeah. see the population, the world population reduced by. Uh, well, I mean, the whole population yeah. issue is that, no, I mean, I, I agree and I disagree. We certainly need to control the population. That means certain practices of the Roman Catholic Church and their views of contraception are absolutely obsolete. But, but equally, we can sustain the amount of people on the planet on the basis that income is redistributed in a more efficient and better way. And there is no momentum to do that. Okay. So population control has led to a very nefarious kind of, thought processes about Malthusian liquidation and huge layers of poverty and segregation, which were historically a north-south divide, but now it, now it's not just that. It, it's okay. with the virus, it's huge swathes of America and, and other countries as well. Oh, okay. And Brazil, we didn't mention Brazil last week. What seems to be happening in Brazil seems to be a kind of form of internal genocide. It's really, okay. it's really David, appalling. Okay, David, uh, we, we, we must get to the papers because... Uh, okay. Time is limited. The Irish Times uh, government adds US, United States, Canada, France and Italy to the mandatory quarantine list. Well, well um, I mean, who would be able to travel anywhere? I mean, also, why would you want to travel if you have to quarantine yourself? Um, uh, yeah. Um, it's going to be endless. Uh, and passports with data and so on. It seems to me that as these things stagger open, uh, as there is more and more developments, there is no doubt some sort of consensus-driven viewpoint that they want to restrict people's travel as much as possible or make it as difficult for them or monitor uh, yeah. why they are traveling and for what reason. Yeah. And, um, you know, once you get to qu quarantines are a feature of, uh, you know, uh, absurd asylum detention scenarios, the treatment of swine and cattle, uh, and there is an awful danger of dehumanisation uh, taking place at all levels um, in, in uh, and Ireland again uh, is beyond belief, it's the most extreme of all as ever. Mm -hmm. we, we were talking briefly um, just before we, we, went, we went on air uh, we were mentioning uh, about uh, property and Yes, Fintan O'Toole has, uh, is showing some glimmers now within the obviously confined structure of the Irish Times of independent intellectual courage. And he, he's made a point in his article, which I think is which a double point, that in a sense, the, the ties of cohesion that held Ireland together in terms of its civic structure uh, were priests, but, but he means that in, in the sense of uh, a degree of values of, of, of compassion, Christianity, uh, and a, a degree of social observance, uh, and a certain set of parameters and rules, so, and property. And, you know, even Michael Smurfett, I remember, famously said something to the effect that he ensured that all of his workers got a two-up, two-down house, otherwise they wouldn't work. We've now reached... Guinnesses, Guinnesses would be uh, Guinnesses uh, had tithe cottages and in Dublin. Yeah, well, exactly, and you've got those uh, 
those Protestant cultures here in the four courts as well, which are like that as well. Um, 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 that, that, that a lot, a lot of that was Protestantism. And of course, Smurfit, I think, is a Protestant. And it's a different mindset. But what has happened in the mortgage and um, rental market in Ireland is an intergenerational catastrophe at this stage. People are not going to be able to afford ownership anymore unless they have inherited wealth. Uh, properties and spaces will be ever the more dehumanizingly small, which will affect their mental health, their ability to bring up families and children. Um, uh, they, okay. the, the uh, uh, it's out of control. I know, but I, <clears throat> I think that's we've established that, that it's been out of control really for maybe 35 years. It's an industry. We sell each other our houses every 10 years and it's, it's not going to, it's not sustainable, but uh, what's the problem with renting? You, you, you oh, oh, no, they, they, no. no, there's no, there's no problem with renting. If renting is affordable, yeah. but they don't, they don't control uh, rent or, uh, or control the affordability of rent. They don't get involved ever since a case called Blake v. Madigan in the Irish constitutional courts. Um, and the, 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 they also don't control rent pro space. In other words, how much are you charging for this? Um, I mean, my auntie Hanny lives in Salzburg. And she's over well into her 80s and she's lived in the same place in Salzburg, rented for over 60 years with her husband and her family. They grew up there. And, they're and rent, it's rent controlled. And, and Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's, you know, it's a spacious three bedroom apartment down a, a side street in Salzburg. And it's, it's, it's you know, it's, it's not fancy, but it's very livable and habitable and it's very pleasant. And, um, and that is not the future that we are allocating to people at the moment. No, it's kind of like little pods and a bit like Singapore or Japan. Or Well, it's the, it's the Chinese capitalism, the corporate phenomenon that Sumption has warned about as well. Right. Um, uh, and none of this is, go is going to be conducive towards people's mental, physical health, associational responsibilities or ability to develop a nuclear family structures or any form of. Okay, uh, finally, uh, just on, on, not finally, but um, at last, Fitzwilliam Square Park, is going to be open to the public. Uh, Fitzwilliam Square is. If you've got a key, if you're if you're a key holder, you can get into the park. No, well, I've got it. There's a surreptitious side entrance. Well, <laughs> that won't be necessary for now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I've, it's, it's a, a, it's a, it's a D Dublin. It's the great hidden park of Dublin. Yeah, but also uh, the, the, how 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 did they have that all to themselves for the last? You know, it is extraordinary that it hasn't been open to the public, really. No, it, it is. Um, it's right there. We're, we're, we're blessed. It's one of the few good things about Dublin. We're blessed with some lovely parks. Uh, Marion Square Park is delightful. Mm. Uh, and so is Fitzwilliam Park. And uh, it, it, it is, um, it is one of the few it? urban spaces we have uh, uh, in terms of urban planning that actually makes sense. Yeah. And now, it's, uh, now we can all... Have a look at it. You know, we can all see it now, rather than just the residents of Fitzwilliam Square Park. Yeah, Fitzwilliam Square. Um, call for uh, yeah, call for legislation to tackle long-term property vacancy. That's the same on the yeah. same. Uh, well, calls for which will not materialise in anything. Yeah. Okay. You know, uh, this is uh, the Irish Sun. Uh, they've led with Prince Philip. Um, I noticed the Examiner didn't really mention it at all. <laughs> no, no, I mean... Uh, uh, Just a tiny yeah. little... <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, I mean, Cork has always been uh, a law unto itself. And I would imagine it, it doesn't have any of the interrelatedness historically that the city of Dublin had to the Protestant British community. Uh, <laughs> no. or, or, au contraire. Uh, 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 I mean, Cork's an awful place. And so I remember once uh, showing their attitude towards partially spoken boys. I went down to debating competition there with a, a colleague of mine, and he, he had developed this very odd trinitary accent over a period of time. And this Cork debater in the room got it up, who's now a, a lecturer in Britain. He said, can I give you a point of information, Mr. Fick? Uh, I was always in why is it when some people are born with a silver spoon in their in their mouths, you were born with a silver poker up your arse with that accent <laughs> of yours? Uh, and uh, 
I suspect that has always been the Cork attitude towards uh, royalty or those who perceive themselves as royalty and privilege. Well, you so would say it's, that. It's, um, kind, sorry, so it's, it's kind of... It's kind of uh, they didn't say it about me, funny enough, because I don't think I've got a, a particularly offensively West Brit accent. Um, though there, there are glimmers of it, but there are also glimmers of a Dublin accent. Which is yeah. nice. You also can't be, you can't really be the judge of that. Um, no, I can't. No, no one knows how they sound over uh, after a period of time. And, well, and, and the, the accents, queen, did the queen, when the Queen visited Cork with, I uh, remember the fishmonger. Uh, yeah, yeah. Was Philip with her that time? That I, I think, I, I'm not sure, actually. I was about to say I think so, because he is, was royal consort, but she often uh, d did these things on her own. Um, uh, so, you know, when, one's heart goes out to her as well. I mean, she has done a huge amount in her, you know, I mean, she's one of the things that holds Britain together in, in a way. I quite like this. Um, and, uh, like they, this they've, had a, they've had a very troublesome family to cope with as well. Of course, Prince Philip richly commented on that as well. I mean, he wasn't uh, afraid of even insulting his children if necessary. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I quite like this cartoon, David. Uh, you just, do you see that? Can you see that? Yeah, it's the Queen. And behind that is the shadow of. Uh, well, that's kind of the point I'm making, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. He's lost her. She's lost her supports yeah. her right arm yeah uh, rock i mean uh, there was a similar dynamic in a way with margaret thatcher and, uh, and dennis thatcher uh historically i mean yeah, you know, yeah. He, he was, he was also capable, of, capable of putting his foot in his mouth and it, as as private eye uh said with the dear bill thing yeah but but, but, but she relied on him completely oh, and uh, w one gets the impression that uh she loved him dearly but, uh, but Mar 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 Thatcher with Dennis, yeah. Well, well, certainly the Queen with Prince Philip. Oh, yeah, I would imagine. I mean, yeah, yeah. Physically, they 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 suited each other, didn't they? Together, they were they looked they looked very uh, compatible. Yeah. Um, so it's just Philip, 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 and then the Morning Star. <laughs> yes, no, I noticed that. Yeah, well, I mean, that's communist pettiness gone mad, but but it's also a deliberate statement. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, they did. They, they, they're just not going to touch any of this. Um, yeah. uh, 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 it, it, it is. Uh, I mean, it is kind of funny, you know. Circulation three hundred. I don't know. What, you know I mean, uh, but but uh, but it's good to see there are still some uh, elements of that kind of mindset around, though it's it's a little off centre. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, French wine harvest in peril as blast of winter frost withers spring vines. It's oh, well, it's very national, cold, uh, right? obviously a national tragedy for the French. No, but, I, but it's very extremely cold, isn't it, for this time of the year? Um, yeah, I mean, work. look, I mean, one doesn't know exactly how the nuances and tropes of climate change or, or climate adjustments are taking place. And um, I thought it was warming. I thought it was supposed to be warm. Well, it, 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 I think part of the pattern is it seems to be erratic. Uh, it can be warm or cold or something like that. And that's not conducive to seasonal growth of crops or, or anything of that nature. Well, didn't um, they predict the Ice Age in the 70s? Maybe this is the Ice Age. They got it wrong again, you know. Anyway, you... Look, Let's trust the experts anyway, no matter what. Uh, well, it depends what experts we're talking about, you know. They seem to know what they're talking about, David. Let's... let's... They, yeah, well, I, I, I believe in enhanced uh, rational scepticism about everything. Any tips for the for the Grand National today? No, no, no. I didn't even realise it was on today. Uh, maybe I should watch that. I think that's the that's the best. Uh, yeah, no, it 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 is. Yeah, uh, it is. I mean, there's something of a kind of old fashioned British gentleman about him. Well, he probably uh, was. He probably was one of that. Um, yeah, I mean, um, I think. I mean, some of the see. comments, I don't want to condone some of the comments, but and some of them are unforgivable. Uh, but you kind of admire the gumption to say it. You know, it's like, uh, at one level, he was kind of like uh, Dame Edna, uh, as an ambassador for Britain, he was a bit like uh, Dame Edna's character, Barry Humphrey's character, yeah. uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, Sir, Sir Les Patterson. Patterson yeah, uh, Patterson. Uh, the uh, cultural attaché for the Australian thing. I mean, he, he could, he just shoot shot from the hip, but many of the comments are very prescient and very intelligent and very smart and very spot on. Yeah. Um, I'm just trying to find the Shea Healy thing from Nighthawks. 
Okay. Uh, what, um, yeah, this is it. Um, uh, would you like to see it? It's a very, very short. Sure, sure. Yeah. Uh, second. Yeah, Shay, lovely guy, really just a lovely man. Uh, can you, oh no, second, can you hear that? Charlie Hockey on the Bogan thing. You bit the bullet. Yeah, I heard that. He, he said he took. That's Shay and um, Sean, Sean Doherty. Can you hear it? Yeah, he took. He's saying Sean Doherty. He took the rap for Charlie Hockey. You bit the bullet. And you were the one who was vilified. No! He is the man who is seen as the demon. Is this the time for you to re-emerge uh, with your safety robes on again? Well, no, I'm not in the business of, of putting on a particular type of garb or apparel and all this, or apparel in order to, to, to suit uh, interpretations here with someone or elsewhere. Uh, no, the situation at that time was that I had a job to do. Uh, there was a decision taken in the cabinet that uh, the, the, the prevention of the leaking of matters from cabinet must be stopped. I, as Minister for Justice, had a great responsibility for doing that. I did that. I do feel that I was let down by the fact that people, people knew what I was doing. Did that betray any naivety in yourself that you thought that, that uh, they'd stand by you when the time came? I, I did believe that I had an obligation to fulfill the constitution obligation to establish who was taking information out of the most important boardroom in the country and making it available without authority uh, to the national media and to uh, others. And I felt that that was wrong. So also did my colleagues in Kevin feel that was wrong. And consequently, I was required to ensure that that would be stopped. And I consulted uh, with the authorities at that time. And one of the methods that uh, was decided upon that the telephones had their phones. Yeah, so that, that was the first time he'd kind of, that this was a having a decision. And, well, yeah, I, you know what's interesting about that, going back in time, what a furore it caused. Now, flash forward a bit in time, Andrew Kenny says when he was Taoiseach, I work, work with the assumption my phone's bugged all of the time. Uh, and now we've got a, a police state where everybody watches everybody and everything is, is recorded. Yeah. And they reached a the point, I've told this story, that Judge Hardiman, uh, who's Fortunately, Dad um, um, became a good friend, reasonable friend of mine towards the end of his life. He'd always say to me, David, uh, uh, we'll meet in a small little uh, snug. I know the manager uh, will go to the back. It, it'll be all quiet. And it is disgraceful that the stakeholders, and the decision makers, and the gatekeepers of the democracy, uh, and he, he was a paragon of virtue in, in many ways, um, uh, have to take those levels of precaution to stop the snooping state surveillance um, that is now yeah. uh, uh, all encompassing in Ireland. I mean, at least they were having a discussion about it then. <laughs> and, and the context of the discussion as well is the stopping of leaking from cabinet. Mm. It, it isn't the mass bugging of everybody left, right, and centre, which oh, the police incredible and to think security secure attack are, are now involved. Yeah. Incredible I mean, to think that Leo Varadkar is facing charges of, you know, breaking the Official Secrets Act. His leaking, his leak, uh, leaking history is uh, would have Sean Doherty up the wall. <laughs> yes, but I don't. The other paradigm shift is, of course, um, they're, leaking, they're leaking before the meeting's over. <laughs> well, well, ultimately Doherty fell his sword, and and Charlie Hawhey was prosecuted. Um, but, but of course, the prosecution did not uh, uh, see itself out for reasons to do with constitutional doctrine, pre-trial publicity and certain comments that were made by Mary Harney and so on. Yeah, yeah. But I, I predict I predict uniformly that Veracca will not be prosecuted. No, I know, no, 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 I know. I, well. And so I think there has been a sea change all for the worse. When people draw a comparison between the period of the 1980s, which Conor Cruz O'Brien termed Gubu Gritop, grotesque, unbelievable, yeah. bizarre, unprecedented. Yeah, we well, we, we've now got Gubu by 150. Um, or, or, or the Gubu is so bad in Ireland now, it's like Theodora Adorna's comment, uh, beyond language. It's indescribably... Uh, I mean, to, to relate to people or explain to people the, the level of 
institutionalist framing corruption. I mean, when you start framing people for child sex abuse, you've reached a, a cultural no-no, yeah. unacceptable in any civilized society. Yeah. And you are no longer a democracy. You're more like, you know, Idi Amin Dada in, in Uganda, if that's yeah. the level you're stooping to. And many of our decision makers are stooping to that level. Um, a level I would have thought that Charles Hockey would not have stooped to, despite all his many failings. And yeah. there's no doubt there's been a total degradation, a decadence, a slippage of standards in public life, the police force, the HSC, and it's become unlivably awful. Well, I think the McCabe uh, was the watershed, should have been the watershed, but we, we learned nothing. The tribunal was a joke. And... Well, the tri Char Charlton's tribunal was worse than a joke. It was a travesty and a farce. I absolutely agree. I think I wrote about it, it was a poorly performed French farce, like a Fadum farce or something like that. It's something so comical and, and so ludicrous that one couldn't, and this is from a, a supposedly a, a tribunal, one couldn't take any of it seriously. And of course, praise to the, to praise to the heavens by the, by the mainstream media. Um, David, you, you, you were writing about the East End of London this week, uh, that you, you were up. Um, yeah, I went on a Saturday to uh, Thames Magistrates Court, yeah. which was Bowes Magistrates Court, and it's, a, it, it's the heart of the East End of London. And I had constructed something about the previous time I was there, which was about two years ago, which just shows how we've gone through this big pause, you know, yeah. Um, and um, I resurrected it a little bit. Uh, it, it's an extraordinary place. Uh, 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 you've got the magistrate's court, and then right opposite it is now a car rental place. And they didn't know in the courtroom, but I did, that the car rental place was the scene of the Cray's big famous club. And if you go out the door, walk down literally 100 yards, there's the flagship Pablo Bells or, 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 or the Boeing of the of East London, which was also a watering hole for for all of those people, uh, and I was invited there once, which is implicit in the article. And then, if you go down a little bit further, uh, you have the great Christopher Wren Church, rather destroyed by the Blitz, but still recognisably so. Saint Mary Le Bow. One of the points the article was making because I know you were a bit annoyed at me last week uh, and you wanted to ask me more, which you can do now about the religious issue of what Oren Doyle had said. It was noticeable that that church was open for worship on Friday and Sunday, not Saturday, but, but it was open Easter Friday, Good yeah. Friday and Easter Sunday. And of course, we shut all the churches down. Yeah, yeah. And the, 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 that church is where the bells, the bow bells. Uh, yes, yeah. Were, uh, Dick Whittington stayed in London and became Lord Mayor because of it. Legend has it. Uh, uh, those born within uh, the sounds are Morris James Micklewhite, uh, Michael Caine, who lives in Leatherhead, mm -hmm. are, are, are classifiable as cockney. So apparently the bells, though now silent, are quite loud. Yeah, I mean, you can but, hear but, but, it, but it's a belly. It's, it's the centre of the East End of London, yeah. Yeah, you can hear them in, in Highgate, in fact, the bells. Oh, can you? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. But, but but it's a uh, it, it's a, it's a very strange mixture of uh, one of your know, and, yeah, yeah one of your one of the people who commented on the piece, which people re re liked quite a lot actually. Yeah, but, but that's because your readers like it light, I think sometimes. But 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 one of the points made about it was of course that uh, there are some great things there, but also there are other things that are not so safe. That's Reggie Cray and Barbara Windsor in the double. Yeah, o. who died, unfortunately, recently, Barbara yeah. Windsor, that is. But of course, I, I, one of the things I warn against is design. I, I, I'm not a great believer of designer or radical chic or associating with oh. undesirables or anything like that. Uh, uh, you know, the swing 60s really got out of control, I think, uh, uh, at all sorts of levels. Not that I was part of it, but I mean... I mean, um, but but um, well, the twins know, were interesting. They, I mean, they were photogenic, kind of strange. The twins were incredibly. Yeah, I, I, and there'd be lots of things about them uh, as well. But one shouldn't. One of the points the article is making: we shouldn't glamorize gangsterism in any form, uh, well, nor glamorize say, gangsters. Yeah. Um, uh, and the gangsters are gangsters. The but, but but one of the points I was trying to make, also, which I did at the end, is sometimes we have to understand what the definition of a gangster is. It isn't just Ronald and Reginald Cray. It's also, 
you know, someone like Peter Sutherland or Henry Kissinger. I mean, Hitchens, of course, famously suggested in a book which became a film that Kissinger should be tried for crimes against humanity because of Cambodia uh, uh, and indeed Indonesia, uh, which was an awful atrocity that Jerry Ford himself and Chile, uh, uh, probably the assassination and culpation, the assassination of Allende. Um, oh, and, uh, uh, and Kissinger's, sorry? Oh, actually, yeah, yeah. K- Kissinger's, or sorry, Hitchens' book led to one act of a French judge seeking to uh, arrest Kissinger when he was in Paris. He had to hopscotch back. Um, um, of course, he's protected and venerated by the Americans, um, uh, but he is a, a, a cor- an international corporate statecraft gangster criminal uh, of gar- gargantuan proportions. But it also is a, a very revealing that corporate or political or statecraft gangsters, as long as they win, they are protected. There's a tremendous thing that um, no, who was a great, great man, was Ro- Robert McNamara, K- Kennedy and Johnson, Secretary of State. Mm. He was talking about trying people for war crimes. He said, look, when I was involved in the Second World War, assisting Curtis LeMay with the carpet bombing of Tokyo, we knew it had no military objective. Tokyo was a wooden city. We killed loads of millions, hundreds of thousands of innocent people. If if the Japanese had won, I would be tried for as a yeah, 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 and, and it, 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 It's that those, and, and, and for his his work in in Vietnam and Cambodia. I mean, well, well yes, indeed. Um, um, even though you could say about McNamara that he is very reflective of many good qualities. Uh, and if you're in that type of position, you, you engage in those type of activities. But 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 it is not a defense. No. It's like the Eichmann defense. I was only about obeying orders. Yes, I made mistakes. I was told what to do. Well, that doesn't exonerate you if what you did do was what you did do. No. Um, no. And I think we're living in a universe now where... Um, as a penologist or, or someone who, who's quite reflective about his craft in criminal defence work, and, uh, among other things, and writes a lot about it, that we're living in a world where the distinction between, you know, that which is, it, it's like we, we, we prosecute, you know, Les Miserables by Victor Hugo, prosecute yeah. someone uh, or chase them to the ends of the earth for the theft of a loaf of bread. Mm. But, but, but if, you, if you steal the world, yeah. which many yeah. of the uh, corporate transnationals are doing, then you're acclaimed. Now, you, David, just because we we're running a bit out of time, you yes. you, represent, you represented Freddie Fingers, uh, Freddie the Fingers. I, I think, though, I, 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 I may be getting a slightly muzzled in my mind. It was someone called Freddie the Fingers. <laughs> but, 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 but the question is, is that, because uh, you corrected that on me, um, I, I, is, I, I, it, I, is yeah. it Freddie Foreman? Yeah, uh, was, uh, I, I think it might be just someone called Freddie the Fingers, um, because okay. I was looking for that super gay, um, and of course, the, the, we would not like to go on about why the person was called, uh, yeah. you know, uh, uh, yeah. uh, and so on. But but it wasn't that, because uh, he had nice other, fingers, other than that, the narrative is true, and yeah. uh, there's not that much a poetic license taken. No. Um, but but um, uh, and you know, it, it was a chilling enough experience at the time. I, I do think it's generally important, though. It does raise an important point about professional propriety as well. Uh, one should avoid becoming friends with one's clients or getting too close to them. I've seen it be the downfall of many professional representatives that they regard their clients as their friends. Uh, right. uh, and, well, be, be, be careful who you associate with in that place. Fingers <laughs> asked you for a drink, didn't he? You said, come down. Yeah, well, yeah, 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 exactly. I mean, I, I largely... Um, I, I, it does make me an aloof... Uh, 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 an unfriendly human being. Yeah. But you have to realise you're there to do a clinical job yeah. to the best of your ability. And of course, empathy or, or friendliness with someone often detracts from an ability to do a proper job. There's a fine line between empathy and being a friend of yours. But then, um, a friend but of finger said to you, yeah, but yeah. Finger said to you, he said, he said, if you hadn't won the case, he would have. Uh, yeah, yeah, very threatening. Yeah, um, um, I, I don't think it was Freddie Foreman in retrospect. No, but 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 he did he did say that, and it was that pub. Um, uh, <laughs> and um, I I didn't go. No, no, of course not. And 
no. Because no. he earned his nickname not because he not because he was beautiful hands. Well, I should say that was thirty years ago in in England when attitudes to the Irish were markedly different. Yeah. I think yeah. they, they've significantly vastly improved. Um, um, uh, I know they, I, I don't want to be too critical. The Brits have always been extremely welcoming of the Irish. I have no time for. You know, Fintan O'Toole's attitude towards Brexit was a kind of disgrace. Yeah, it was. Particularly because his family were all set up by the Brits and his brother and so on. And it was it was a glorified Brit bashing. Yeah, um, I agree. And, uh, and that's not acceptable. You are a guest arbiter or a visitor in another country. You've got to, to some extent, culturally adapt. Those are obligations. Yeah, and, he got it wrong and, as well. I mean, he got it wrong. He got it wrong about the English character completely. No, wrong. he's to, he's totally wrong. But yeah. Brexit didn't have things to do with chauvinism or nationalism as such. It had that was part of it. But 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 it is an absolute uh, justifiable outrage at the bureaucracy, which is now just basically uh, German interest destroying the social structure of every other country in Europe, <laughs> Greece, in, uh, Ireland. In, not bailing them out and inflicting austerity on them. Demonstrated by the vaccine, demonstrated by the vaccine rollout as well, I think, you know, that whole... It's, yeah, it, and you know. it's like one last ride for those Eurocrats. They've cocked everything up. It, it doesn't mean that in its inception, uh, which is even something Thatcher was in favour of, in its inception, well, yeah, I mean, as long as you had movement of goods, uh, travel, and so on, fine. But it's like a bayonet. It's got completely out of control in terms of regulation, standardization, bureaucracy, uh, and many of its social reforms are of dubious uh, quality. The European Convention is a separate system, but that seems to be neutered now. I mean, I, I, I genuinely think at this stage, it's like uh, people don't get this, but the Hanseatic League collapsed. All, 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 all interregional or regional uh, organizations have a shelf life and i can't see the eu surviving certain of the social trends and uh, political trends going on in europe at the moment uh you mean uh, like poland and hungary and the authoritarianism and, uh, the fascism uh, there was a big dispute several years ago in relation to austria uh, when austria erect, uh, elected the freedom party which was Haider's yeah. party but 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 but, but when uh, state authoritarianism slash fascism well, well, that undermines the very basis in which the EU and the European Convention were set up. Uh, and so and, and the Germans have been exercising a degree of almost brutal economic control, which is not, to use that old fashioned expression, communitaire at all. Yeah. So it is very difficult to see what the EU does anymore, except serve itself and serve uh, its corporate masters, sponsors and payers. And that was part of the legitimate objection of the British to Brexit. And Fintan O'Toole distorted that in a kind of reverse chauvinistic way, uh, like a punch cartoon version of the Brits, comparable to the punch cartoon version the Brits had of the Irish. And uh, I wrote two pieces for Cassandra Voices criticising his attitude in this respect. And... Um, in fact, Martin Turner, the cartoonist on the Irish lands as well, is, 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 is portrays the British like that as well. In, 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 you know, well, well, well they're, they're very. I mean, who, I mean, look, I mean, on the assumption that all politicians are, are with one or two exceptions, have become part of the light entertainment industry, uh, 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 and what would doubt severely much of the competence of many of them, uh, for all its clownishness and mistakes and all of this, um, the British government have probably reacted better than, than what's happening in Ireland, which is terrifying. Yeah, yeah, it is terrifying, uh, David, but we've sadly run out of time. Oh, uh, yeah. right, okay. Fantastic, uh, great to talk to you. Uh, apologies for not getting up earlier. <laughs> yeah, don't, don't mind, it's often my, 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 my uh, uh, my culpability in that respect. I might send you a brief uh, email about other things for okay. uh, you, you. You you take your day of relaxation. No, 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 not at all. And uh, so, was it just? I just wonder. I, I know I have these awful afterthoughts. Uh, so, one other point we should have mentioned actually is the uh, the North Northern riots. Sure. Um, I mean. John Hume is dead recently. 
and um, it, it was his great achievement and the achievement of many people ultimately. And to think that that particular tinderbox is about to explode again it is an awful reflection of the social dislocation and chaos going on in the world at the moment. And as I understand it, it is because of the virus has created sea embargoes and thus the unionists feel that is a form of separation, but it is a separation by events and acts of the virus, but that will not assuage necessarily the Europe uh, unionist fears of being integrated within a united Ireland um, and not being part of the United Kingdom, particularly in post-Brexit land. Mm -hmm. And more to the point, it is probably going to lead to other riots and counter-riots and counter-demonstrations. Well, and let's see, let's see, let's see. Let, let us hope that same voices uh, in the governance of the North of Ireland, because I visited Belfast, I've written something about this, which you haven't published yet, but I visited some years ago and I looked delightful um, 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 talk in Queen's University and I haven't been to Belfast in 30 years I was, the last time I'd been there, there were people, soldiers with some machine guns in, in, in the station when I arrived in from Dublin this time I was greeted by a flower lady who took mercy on me and said I'll show you what Queen's University Belfast is and she, she walked me down there and it, it was hugely uh, gentrified, regenerated and it really was a much more pleasant place. And it was a shock going to it because Dublin has deteriorated so badly. And one really hopes that that doesn't fall apart. Yeah, well, it, does, it seems to me that it, the reaction is a bit over the top. I mean, it does seem like a lot of kids just... Yeah, know, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I, mean I, I, I would have more confidence in the governance of the leaders of the north of Ireland than the south of Ireland, significantly more so. Um, yeah. Uh, at this stage. Okay, okay. Uh, David, on that, on that bombshell, we shall leave it. Thank you very much uh, for joining us this morning. And uh, thank you. And David's column is on the site. All right. Easter. There was also, sorry, one final point. There's also something I wrote three days previously, which yeah. I'm really uh, proud of. You got um, lost a bit. Um, on Sydney Kentridge, um, yeah. the great human rights law. Yeah. And I just think it's something that I'd like people to read because it's very important to preserve that tradition of civic decency in the legal profession. Okay, I'm trying to think of what the headline was over that. Uh, but Marlon uh, Brando is the photograph. Yeah, Mar Mar Marlon Brando played Kit Ketridge in a film called Dry White Season. And yeah. uh, it's a fascinating story about Ketridge, who's still alive, he's 98 years of age. Uh, he's almost, in fact, Prince Philip's age. In fact, he may be 99 now. Yeah, he represented um, the family of Stephen Biko, who was killed. Yes, uh, he also he also uh, represented this extraordinary. He represented Nelson Mandela at his trial. It, it, it's not incredible. And then he became chairman of the Bar Council and Queen's Council in South Africa. And like the most famous, I think it was called Big Said, Big Said. I don't know, I've never met him. But, and then, you know, he was well nigh 60 or well into his 50s. And he then completely annoyed them by representing Steve Biko. And they went for him, like, like the most famous lawyer in the country, they went for him, like, you know, savagely. I think it stripped him of his title of QC, took his ass. He, uh, he, he left that with a bag. Yeah. And so, of course, did the writer Donald Woods. And, you know, I mean, yep. Yep. but, but what, 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 what I was saying implicitly as well is there's no question, you know, these are dark times now. And, a lot of the world reacting the way some of South Africa did in the 70s. And that's the most important point to appreciate. And the precious social conscience or civic or human rights conscience is not plentifully obvious. Well, it might, it may, it may, may come, uh, I mean, it came in South Africa, it might come. come yes, but the consequences as well, because the article is also about the issue of whistleblowing. Uh, yeah. and, a point a, a, a UCD academic made, the, the, and poor Jonathan Sugarman. I mean, the way they treated him in Ireland was a disgrace, and rendering him an unemployable, gibbering person in a way. I don't mean that in a bad way. I'm just saying they, and there's no doubt that the psychotic treatment of, of, of whistleblowers, it, but rendering them out to be cranks is appalling. And the way the Americans, this is how it arose, the article actually, this time. 
because I was on television uh, uh, and I was speaking about Julian Assange, the way the Americans have chased Assange to the ends of the earth for doing the right thing. Mm, and it's a great civic courage and decency for the judge in Westminster Magistrates Court to stop that extradition for yeah. the moment. Uh, the dark times for human rights lawyers and S Sir Sidney Kettridge's legacy should be central in everybody's mind. Well, not that he's dead yet. No, and, uh, no one wish him because he is very close, I think, to Prince Philip's head. Yeah, so we'll, no, we'll look at it that way. Okay. So I, 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 think, I think Sidney might be at 98 or 99. I don't know. Yeah, I, think I don't know. Yeah. Um, thank you, David, for, uh, yeah. for another excellent uh, contribution. Um, and thank you. And we'll hopefully see you on the site on Monday. Thank you.